Welcome back to the Stigma Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Hayes. And today we are going to get a lesson in central nervous system drug development from somebody who knows more about developing drugs in this space than anybody I've ever met. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Errol D'Souza. He is a leader in the industry for developing therapeutics for treating central nervous system disorders. He has substantial experience as an executive in the biopharma industry. He's founded numerous companies. He's been the CEO of public companies. He's on the board of numerous companies in this space. I'm going to let him give you a little bit more of a detailed bio background in just a moment. But in this conversation, we're going to cover everything from schizophrenia to Alzheimer's disease to developing drugs for psychiatric disorders, for neurological disorders, this you know PTSD, et cetera. We're going to get into his current company, Bionomics, and what they're doing. This is really an informative primer of sorts on developing drugs to treat the mind, to treat central nervous system disorder. So I am extremely excited to share this conversation with you. I learned a lot from it. This is honestly one of those conversations where I have to take a bunch of notes and go back and do a ton of homework on a lot of the words that were used here that I don't quite understand. And I am thrilled to share it with you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. D'Souza and say, sir, thank you for being here. It's really an honor and a joy to get to have this conversation and, and share your thoughts with, with our audience. Thanks for having me here. And maybe I can start off with a little bit on my background and focus on treatment of mental health disorders, which is what excites me and drives me. I've had experience in academia in the biotech and big pharmaceutical industries. By way of background, in the 80s, I was at Johns Hopkins University, and my laboratory was at the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, where I worked at the Addiction Research Center. And in particular, we were involved with identification of receptors involved in stress, which is a big component of mental health disorders. From there, I transitioned after several years of consulting for the pharmaceutical industry to DuPont Merck, where I was head of uh, CNS diseases. And I spent about three years there learning pharmaceutical drug development as it relates to CNS disorders. And then I was seduced by the venture side to start a company in San Diego called Neurocrine Biosciences, which was focused on brain endocrine immune interactions. And this is a company I started in 92, which has a market cap of about $10 billion currently and markets drugs for treatment of neurological disorders as well as other mental health disorders. From neurocrine, I moved back into the pharma industry as the worldwide head of research for Herx, Marion, Russell. And with the merger to form Aventus, I was the head of research and development responsible for drug development, both for neurological, psychiatric, as well as immunological disorders based in the U.S. And developed several drugs for neurological disorders, including one that's on the market for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. I left Aventus in about 2002 to move back into the biopharmaceutical um, company called Synaptic Pharmaceuticals, which was focused on G-protein couple receptors, which has been a target for many mental health disorders. I ended up selling that company to Lundbeck, which has developed several drugs for treatment of depression, et cetera, and then moved to the Boston area to head up several private and public companies both in the CNS space, the diabetes space, and working with oligonucleotides. My primary focus these days is working with companies in terms of developing drugs for mental health disorders. In particular, most of my time is spent with Bionomics, which is an Australian-based company developing drugs for central nervous system disorders by targeting ion channels. And we'll focus on some of the candidates that Bionomics is currently developing. So just to kind of give our audience some education, how do you develop a central nervous system drug? And is it 
Is it any different than developing other types of pharmaceuticals? I think there's a lot of similarities when you think about developing a drug for central nervous system disorders, but there are also some differences. So let's talk about the similarities. You identify a receptor that would be, or a molecular target that would be, you know, of interest for targeting the drug that you may be looking for. It may be a small molecule. And in, in, as it relates to central nervous system disorders, probably most of the therapeutic modalities are small molecules because you have, you know, the added requirement for the therapeutic to cross the blood-brain barrier and to get to its target site in the brain, you know, unlike a lot of other disorders where biologics have, have made you know, lots of inroads and really command a good portion of the market. I think small molecules are still the mainstay for central nervous system disorders. So you would identify small molecule therapeutics with high affinities to either upregulate the particular receptor or downregulate it, as is the case sometimes. And then you would look for biological activity, and then you would you would take it through efficacy in terms of animal models. And animal models, I think, and and I'm going to focus in now in particular with respect to sort of mental health disorders or neurological disorders, that's where some of the differences may lie. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about mental health disorders and, and what are the animal models that might be pertinent to the development of mental health disorders. Well, what's depression in a rodent? That's very difficult to be able to develop. So you end up devising some, I'll call them artificial models in terms of, for example, stressing an animal either acutely or in a chronic situation and developing some models there that may have overlapped in terms of some of the symptomatology that you may see in the clinical setting. And then you may evaluate some of your drug candidates in these settings. For example, if you look at an indication that we'll talk a little bit more about, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, you're dealing with trauma and memories And you want to think about extinguishing some of these memories. So you can develop some animal paradigms, which are looking at extinction types of models to be able to develop it. You know, for me, the paradigm that I like best is for mental health disorders in particular, or even for neurological disorders, is not to rely on any one single model, but to look at a spectrum of models and to get a good sense of what the drug may be doing that may be able to pick up some of the symptoms that you would want to treat in some of these devastating disorders. And when you think about mental health disorders like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorders, DSM criteria have put these in different boxes. But when you do clinical assessment, You've got a variety of criteria. For example, for post-traumatic stress disorder, you have an anxiety component. You also have components related to depression. You have components related to, you know, memories and extinguishing memories. So you may be looking at different paradigms to be able to pull out some of these symptoms that you may be able to treat. And then, obviously, the commonality for treatment of all of these disorders is you would, you'd want to put your molecule through rigorous safety tests and show that you have a very good safety or therapeutic margin, as we refer to it. That is, that the doses that show efficacy in these animal models are significantly lower than doses where you may start seeing you know, some of the first side effects. And you want that margin to be as big as possible before you start, you know, any human trials in terms of moving forward. So that is, I think, at a very high level, you know, 
the roadmap, at least from a discovery perspective, into sort of drug discovery. And then we can talk more about sort of the drug development paradigms in terms of moving forward. Oh, yeah, that's really helpful and really educational for me as someone who's certainly a novice and trying to understand the space. One thing that someone told me who is working in this space is that a lot of the traditional biopharma and drug development companies, some of them don't even touch CNS altogether. Is it harder? Is it more complicated? Is there more demand for these drugs or less? Like, What are some of the dynamics around who's working on it and why? And if it's maybe harder or easier to develop drugs in this space versus other spaces? Great question. And it's a timely question because I think there's been, you know, some paradigm shifts that are probably pertinent to, you know, what we're looking at. So if you think about CNS drug discovery and development, they really fall into two categories, development of drugs for psychiatric disorders and development of drugs for neurological conditions. So let me focus in first in terms of development of drugs for psychiatric indications. This was a very hot area in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. You can think about, you know, the 80s and 90s when many of the antidepressants, you know, Prozac, all of those came to the market, and these are all multi-billion dollar drugs. But uh, psychiatric indications are probably some of the more difficult ones in terms of, of drug development. You know, if I go back a little bit and look at the industry back in the, you know, 50s and 60s, development of drugs for psychiatric indications really came about from clinical investigation, probably more so than sort of the traditional drug discovery approach that I described previously. So as an example, you know, a drug that might have been developed for, you know, depression early in evaluation, the psychiatrist in early clinical investigation might have found some utility for schizophrenia and moved it forward in that indication. And the early class of drugs, for example, for depression, were what's commonly referred to as the tricyclic antidepressants. And then in the 80s, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors were probably a refinement on the tricyclic uh, antidepressants where they were targeting you know, one particular molecular target, the serotonin uptake inhibitors. But the difficulty in clinical development for psychiatric indications has been really the failure rate that led I, uh, many companies, many large pharmaceutical companies, to abandon the space. And I remember a time when I was on the Board of Scientific Counselors for the National Institute of Mental Health when Tom Insel was the head of the group where we were asking ourselves, you know, who is going to bear the brunt of development of new indications for psychiatric disorders. Well, you know, I think we are coming back in terms of the biotech industry to a great extent now taking on, I think, the challenge. And you've got several companies that are looking at developing drugs for the treatment of psychiatric disorders through two sort of paradigms. One is potentially repurposing of drugs that might have been out there for one indication that could be used for another. Or the second space that I think is a, is a good emerging space is in the area of psychedelics, which are being used in conjunction with, with psychotherapy. And that's creating, I think, a whole new paradigm for the treatment of mental health disorders in terms of, you know, an in-clinic setting and moving forward. Now, I focused on, on psychiatric indications. Let me say a little bit on the other part of CNS, drug discovery and development, where I would say 
big pharma and a lot of biotech companies are very active in the space, and that is for the treatment of neurological disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, many orphan diseases that are devastating diseases, where frankly, there is very little on the market to treat these disorders. And the drug discovery and development for these indications at a high level moves sort of in in two directions. One is to look at classes of molecular targets that might improve some of the symptoms involved in these diseases. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, clearly there's cognitive deficits, and you would be looking at drugs that increase memory. And at Bionomics, we're involved in that. And in fact, our Merck collaboration is developing drugs for improvement of of cognitive deficits in, in Alzheimer's disease. But the second area is where where I think a lot of discovery has been made is in identifying a genetic linkage to many of the neurological disorders. And there, it's much better than in psychiatric disorders. So, you know, you've you've all heard about beta amyloid involvement or tau involvement in Alzheimer's disease, or many of the aggregated proteins involved in neurological disorders like Parkinson's or Huntington's or amyotropic lateral sclerosis. So that provides a good starting point in terms of developing drugs for the treatment of many of these neurological disorders. But there again, the failure rate on many of these has been fairly high. But having said that, the unmet medical need, the cost of healthcare is so high that this is an area of very active discovery and investment as it rightfully should be so, given the aging population. So let me stop there. I agree with you, and I I, I appreciate that primer of sorts, and I think a, a lot of our listeners will too, and I, I love that you mentioned Tom Insel. I was actually just on the phone with him a couple of days ago. He's He's an absolutely incredible human being, has done a lot to, to help us in what we're doing here, and was a guest on our show recently. Well, Tom and I were, you know, have worked together on the bench side by side and have published several papers together with, when I was at Johns Hopkins and Tom was at a starting investigator at the National Institutes of Mental Health. Tom is a good buddy of mine. That's fantastic. And you had, you had mentioned that you've been spending a lot of your time on a project with Bionomics and you guys are focusing on PTSD. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about what you're working on there. Yeah, at Bionomics, we've got a molecule that we refer to as BNC210, which is in the clinic and phase two trials for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. So let me spend a little bit of time telling you about this exciting drug and the potential for it. So BNC210 is... The molecular target for it is it is a negative allosteric modulator of the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So that's a mouthful. So what do we mean by negative allosteric modulator? Essentially, it dampens the activity of a particular subtype of the nicotinic receptor, which has been involved in depression, anxiety, and stress-related disorders. So BNC210 has, if you look at its attributes, both in the preclinical setting, that is in animal models, and in the clinic, what we've shown to date is that it has sort of many of the attributes of the benzodiazepine or Valium class of drugs in that it has an anti-anxiety potential, it is fast-acting, but it doesn't share many of the liabilities of the Valium class of drugs in that it's not sedative, it doesn't produce any sedation, no memory impairment. It also shares many of the positive attributes of the antidepressant class of drugs. And we have, you know, lots of clinical data. We've done 11 clinical trials 
to date, most of them early stage clinical trials, where we've shown both in healthy volunteers and in generalized anxiety disorder patients, the drug has an anti-anxiety potential. We currently are looking at it for the treatment of you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. We had an initial trial that we carried out with an early formulation of the drug, which was a liquid suspension formulation, which unfortunately just missed its primary endpoint. But we fully understand the reasons for that, which was the inadequacy of the formulation in an outpatient setting where we didn't reach the blood level. So we have developed a very nice tablet formulation and are moving back into a second trial, which is targeted to start in the middle of this year. And the FDA has granted us, you know, fast track designation for the treatment of post traumatic stress disorder. The attributes of the drug, you know, both in terms of antidepressant properties, anti anxiety properties, In animal models, we've shown that it enhances extinction, make it really a very nice drug to look at many of the attributes that are involved in in post-traumatic stress disorder. So we're excited about the potential of this drug, and we'll be starting the Phase 2B trial in the middle of this year. We're just completing some of the, putting the final touches on the drug before we start the trial. Tell us a little bit about treating PTSD and maybe in as layman's terms as possible, explain PTSD, what it's doing to us and how we can treat it with a drug and maybe talk a little bit about how we treat it today and and where that treatment may, may evolve in the future when drugs like, like what you guys are developing at at Bionomics uh, are readily available. Yeah, well, post-traumatic stress disorder, as the name suggests, is triggered by a trauma or a stress. I think when most people sort of think of PTSD, they associate it with combat veterans. And there sort of the trigger is probably more obvious in terms of the experience that uh, the bad experience that a veteran may have had in in a combat situation and that trigger you know resurfaces well beyond sort of the initial trauma and it's the recurrence of the trigger and that leads to a variety of symptoms which are related to anxiety in the chronic setting, depressive symptoms, you know, effects on on sleep, suicidality. So the unmet medical need, I think, is very high. But to think about really the overall PTSD population, combat veterans are really a fairly small portion of the population, maybe around 20%. The bulk of or the majority of PTSD patients are actually female. And a lot of PTSD patients, it could be sort of sexual trauma that's been involved early in life that could lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. So a couple of things. PTSD is more than what we think about it in combat veterans, very high in the female population and has you know, multiple symptoms that are involved in the disorders. The only approved drugs for treatment of PTSD currently are a couple of the antidepressants, which are in sort of the serotonin reuptake class. But these compounds show really minimal effects. And so both the FDA and the clinicians really feel that there is a very high unmet medical need for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, which makes it, I think, really imperative for companies like Bionomics as well as others to dedicate the time, the effort, and the investment to develop better therapies for the treatment of this devastating condition and moving forward. There's several different classes of drugs 
you know, that are being evaluated, including, you know, as an example, the folks at the not-for-profit MAPS organization have evaluated MDMA ecstasy as an adjunct to psychotherapy and showed some very encouraging effects. But those are sort of like, you know, treat treatment paradigms. You can't do that for obvious reasons on a chronic basis. Um, and then you have treatments like BNC210, as well as, you know, other companies in the space that are looking to develop therapies. And I could tell you the FDA, in particular, the psychiatry division is really working in a very collaborative manner with companies given the high unmet medical need in this area. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what is the regulatory landscape like? What does it look like for you, you know, in the process? You know, how did you guys get FDA fast tracked? What was that process like? What is the road ahead for you from a regulatory perspective? I could tell you that the FDA, in particular for post traumatic stress disorder, I have nothing but very good things to say about the psychiatry division who's been working with us in a very collaborative manner. You know, as an example, when we were developing, when we were trying to understand sort of what went wrong in our previous, our first PTSD trial with this liquid formulation and, you know, having developed this new solid dose formulation, which we think overcomes the limitations, you know, rather than second guessing the FDA, what we did was requested a type C meeting. And a type C meeting is essentially an advisory meeting, which was granted to us by the division. And we ha- had the meeting in the third quarter of 2019. It was, you know, and I've been to several meetings at the FDA. I've got to say that this was a meeting where I really didn't think we were sitting on opposite sides. It was a dialogue, which was so encouraging, which is how can we work together to move to the next trial and see what we can do in terms of, you know, evaluating the potential of BNC210. But we did that in a rigorous manner in terms of working with them. We addressed several questions, which they provided answers to. We got buy-in. And then we put in, you know, based on our data, the, the hurdles are still there. Based on our data, then we submitted an application for a fast-track designation in September of 2019, and in November, we were granted the fast-track designation. And the fast-track designation allows us to continue to work with the division in a very cooperative manner. So as an example, you know, we're finishing the final pharmacokinetic trial with our new formulation. And what we will do now in the February timeframe is take a whole data set uh, designed for the repeat trial and send it back to the FDA to get their buy-in before we start the trial. So it is very much a collaborative process, I think, in terms of moving forward without you know, shortchanging any of the rigor that the FDA would have in terms of making sure that the treatments that they would be looking at to approve meet the hurdles that would provide the safety and the efficacy for approval. In some of our email correspondence before we got to speak, you had mentioned that you were collaborating, I believe, with Merck on some compounds where I think you may already have them in the clinic for treating other cognitive deficits such as Alzheimer's and others. Can you tell me a little bit about that effort? We have a collaboration with Merck that started in 2014. And the collaboration with Merck, the molecular target there, interestingly, is the same target as BNC210, but it works in the opposite manner. So for post-traumatic stress disorder, we want to dampen the activity of the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. For developing drugs to improve memory, that is cognitive enhancers, we want to target the alpha-7 nicotinic receptor, 
but as a positive allosteric modulator that has increased the function. So that is the molecular target that we're working on with Merck. When we formed the collaboration in 2014, you know, we got 20 million up front. The Merck and the Bionomics teams worked together from 2014 to 2017 and developed several preclinical candidates using a similar paradigm that I described at the beginning of our conversation. The first of these molecules was taken in by Merck into phase one clinical trials in February of 2017. And for that, we got another $10 million milestone. The whole deal is worth about $500 million plus royalties. But the first one of these molecules went into the clinic in 2017. What Merck has communicated to us is that the first molecule has completed phase one safety trials, and it looks good from a safety perspective. Merck is currently evaluating the molecule for biomarker studies. So what does that mean? You can do studies even in phase one where you can use challenge paradigms or imaging techniques to be able to look for the procognitive potential of the drug. And that's what Merck is doing with the first molecule. Now, to give you a sense for Merck's commitment to this collaboration and to this area, in parallel, they've taken a second molecule into development. This was a second generation molecule, which was actually slightly more potent in non-human primate studies. So Merck is currently developing two molecules from the collaboration. And I can say we're very excited at not only the potential for the collaboration, but the potential impact that a company, a big pharma company like Merck, could have in terms of development of this molecule for the treatment of symptoms, cognitive deficits, and Alzheimer's disease. The final thing I will say is when you're dealing with a compound for treatment of cognitive deficits, it's not limited to utility just in Alzheimer's disease because you have other mental health conditions such as schizophrenia where you also see cognitive deficits. So there's these compounds could have utility there or even dementia related to Parkinson's disease. So that's our collaboration with Merck that both parties are very enthusiastic about. And Merck is in fact an investor in bionomics also. It's interesting to me as someone that's obviously a novice around this topic that the same receptor can be attacked to treat PTSD, Alzheimer's. What else can we resolve by attacking that same receptor? And is that coincidence? What's the reasoning behind why, you know, turning it up, I'm going to use the wrong language, obviously, but turning it up or increasing it treats one and, you know, turning it down or dampening it treats another. Right. It's, you know, you've got, you've got several targets you know, that where agonists could have, you know, uh, agonists, when I say agonists, that is to increase the activity. But the beauty, and this is really at the core of what Bionomics as a company does best, what we are talking about when we talk about an allosteric modulator, let me just take a moment to sort of describe sort of what the value is. So, If you look at an indication like anxiety or depression, you have increased activity in the cholinergic system and you want to dampen that. So you want a negative allosteric modulator. But when I say allosteric, what it does is it only brings it down to the normal levels. It doesn't drive it all the way down below normal levels. And if you want to think about treating a condition where you have memory impairment like Alzheimer's disease, where you know the cholinergic function is decreased, you want to bring it up to a normal setting rather than just drive it. And the analogy I use for allosteric modulation is in many of these disorders, you want to get back to the normal state rather than if you are driving a car and you want to maintain 
a particular speed, you are better off doing that with both an accelerator and a brake rather than just having one or the other alone. So that's where allosteric modulation really comes to bear. And, you know, you have several situations where you may be upregulating it for certain indications or downregulating it for other indications. That's really helpful for me as a layperson trying to, to understand what's going on, that that's extremely informative. So thank you for that. Of all the people I've talked to, it feels like you know more about what's going on in this space than, than anybody. And because many of our listeners are aspiring entrepreneurs, builders of businesses in the mental health space, and a lot of them in the CNS drug development space, I wanted to kind of get your take on where's the white space? Where's the opportunity? I mean, where, where where are people not developing that they should, or or maybe what are the adjacent opportunities for for you guys? I mean, where it feels to me like it's wide open, but I, I could be wrong. No, I think when you know when we're thinking about development of drugs for psychiatric disorders or neurological disorders, for that, you know, the unmet medical need is huge. The burden on the public health care is huge. But the challenges are also huge, and therein, I think, lies the opportunity. So what are some of the other areas where I think there's emerging technologies that will, you know, interplay? I think some of that space is being filled in, but that's in more recent times when you start thinking about the digital space. And, you know, I'm sure Tom got into this with, with one of the companies that he started in terms of MindStrong or, or some of the other things. So when you think about the digital space, I think it can be used in a variety of ways. One of the ways where you can start thinking about the digital space is in terms of the patient populations and who may be a responder to one particular drug or drug class, you know, versus another. And that's going to take, I think, developing databases in terms of, you know, getting that information, using that information early on in clinical trials to help the patient. Because if you look at, for example, you know, patients in depression, it's incredible how many different treatments they may go through before they're classified as treatment-resistant depression. You know, can you improve that predictability so that you can get the patient on the right drug in terms of moving forward? The other area, I think, in the digital space could be as an adjunct therapy. So let's come back to post-traumatic stress disorder as an example, where you know, behavioral therapy has a significant improvement in terms of the treatment. Well, the be, you know, behavioral therapy could also be utilized in terms of the digital space. You know, you have companies like Pair Therapeutics that are developing a variety of paradigms that could be utilized for everything from addiction to, you know, PTSD as well as neurological disorders. So that's some of the space that I think is starting to get filled in in a very positive manner. And then the final thing I would say where we need to expand sort of our horizons, you know, often when a company like Binomics or some of the other companies that I work with, we all have our favorite children that we think of as being the best thing for treatment of these disorders. And we continue to be very enthusiastic about BNC210. But you could also think about treatment paradigms. I alluded to before that a trial done by MAPS for PTSD included MDMA three sessions with behavioral therapy. What we could be exploring is how do we look at MDMA treatment or a proprietary MDMA combined with a BMC-210 treatment, either together 
or one followed by the other as an induction maintenance therapy. I think this is the kinds of things that I, you know, as a thought leader, as well as an entrepreneur and someone, I think we need to open our paradigms for the benefit of patients as well as investors. You know, at the end of the day, as someone at the FDA said to me, they really don't care other than what's the best signal that you can get in terms of getting benefit to the patient. So if it's a drug digital therapy in combination, then that would be the paradigm that they would approve. But, you know, the example that I gave you, if MDMA looks good in the short term and BNC210 has value, you could be thinking about an induction maintenance type of therapy for the benefit of the patient, you know, so that they don't relapse. And I think we need to broaden our horizons and frankly work with both the regulatory agencies where there may be some hurdles of taking two unapproved drugs, but they're open to that kind of a dialogue. And, you know, we need to explore that kind of space in terms of bringing to bear all treatment modalities for the benefit of the patients and shareholders. Yeah, I agree with you. And as you were talking, I mean, I couldn't help but think about how long lasting some of the effects of psychedelic treatments are, are that we're seeing in the in the tests that are being done. And I was wondering if if a drug like a, a BNC two ten could be used after a psychedelic treatment to maybe even extend some of those impacts. That is exactly the paradigms we're thinking about. And we would like to be at the forefront of of that development. So I will say to our to your audience, Stephen, stay tuned because that's really the, the value driving aspects in terms of where we could be thinking about taking BNC210. Excellent. Well, look, I, I've really enjoyed this. I, I, I have one more question I, I like to, to wrap up with. You know, look, you've, you've had an incredible career. Uh, you've built a lot of incredible businesses that have, that have helped a lot of people. And, and our audience, again, is, is full of entrepreneurs who want to, do, to follow in your footsteps and do just what you've done. What advice from your learnings along the way that you would give to some entrepreneurs who are starting out early in their career that want to build drugs, they want to build therapeutics, whether it's digital, whether it's, whether it's molecular, to treat mental health disorders and to try to help humans have a better experience here while they're on this planet? Great question, Stephen. And I could tell you what's driven me in a successful manner for all of the companies that I've started and being involved in. I look at, in the space that we're in, we have three constituents. We have patients, shareholders, and employees. And in every decision we make or I make, I ask the question, is this best for patients, shareholders, and employees? And I would like to move forward in situations where the answer is that it benefits all three constituencies. And continuously challenge yourself in whatever you do, and it really doesn't matter what biotech company (laughs) you're in, force yourself to make decisions that are best for the three constituencies. You're going to be in a very successful situation moving forward. If there are situations where you're benefiting shareholders at the expense of employees or patients, think twice about it. Likewise, I have a question for you as a as an investor. You know, there's a lot of capital starting to flow into this space, whether it's psychedelics, whether it's mental health broadly, whether it's digital therapeutics. I believe that the investors have a, a some responsibility here to also do no harm and to not fund things that are going to hurt people or they're going to put profits ahead of of taking care of, of humans. What advice would you give to investors that are coming to this space that don't have the luxury of your uh, knowledge base and your experience and your education here, how can we as investors be good corporate and public citizens as we make decisions around what to support in and around the mental health space? 
Yeah, I think, you know, my favorite type of investor is more sort of the medium term to long term investor, because in the biotech space, you know, we're in a paradigm that takes more years to be able to develop. I mean, that's not saying that investors should tie up their capital for years and not hold management's team to the fire in terms of making the investments. But I think it's difficult investing in this space just if you're looking for a pop over a few days or weeks in terms of moving forward, because I think those milestones don't fit within that paradigm, unless you can get very opportunistic. But I would say to the investors, to a great extent, think about the questions that I asked before in making the decisions. You know, is the management team and the board looking at the various constituents that I defined and use that as a criteria in terms of also making investments? Yeah, that's great advice. I appreciate that. And I think our entrepreneurs are really going to appreciate the advice that you gave to them as well. And and I appreciate what you've spent your life doing. I appreciate that you are working in this space and that you're you're bringing solutions to market that'll help people that have never had help. And so uh, it really means a lot to me as somebody who's uh, suffered from mental health differences. You know, I've been to rehab. I'm, I'm living in recovery from addiction. And so it just personally means a lot to me that the people as smart as you could be doing anything you wanted to do and you're, you've dedicated your life to working in this space. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for taking time to come here and, and talk to us. I've really enjoyed this and I'm certain that our listeners will enjoy it as well. Thank you, Stephen, for the opportunity to talk about the space and to highlight Bionomics. And we're in it for those three constituents. Thanks again. I want to say another special thank you to Dr. D'Souza for being here today and for sharing with us. I think this conversation is not just a primer on central nervous system drug development. There's so many things you could ex- I, I'm going to explore based on this conversation. So I, I hope that it inspires both entrepreneurs and investors and others in and around the mental health space. To our listeners, thank you for being here. And please, if you like the content, we'd love it if you'd hook us up with a subscribe or a like or a review on your podcast platform of choice. And, and ideally, you'd, you'd share us with a friend. To the founders out there, don't forget to join the Mental Health Startup Slack community, which you can also find a link to in the show notes. And for our founder friends, don't forget to check out the What If Fellowship. The fellowship is an eight-week accelerator-style boot camp that we created at What If Ventures to bring mental health startup founders and their ideas to market to take them from an idea to a real plan to execution and funding. Uh, You can learn more through the fellowship tab on the What If Ventures website or through a link in the show notes here. And finally... We want to hear from our listeners. Please do comment on social media. Let us know what you liked, what you want to hear more of, what you disagreed with. Let us know your thoughts. You can reach out to us on Twitter at StigmaCast. You can find us on Instagram at Stigma Podcast. You can email us info at stigmapodcast.com. And obviously you can find us on our website, stigmapodcast.com as well. Thank you again for being here. And until next time, stay safe, be well, and thank you for your support. Thank you.